Thank you. Uh, so in the, this, uh, in the next lecture, I'll continue talking about the TT bar deformation. And in the next one, I will talk uh, about the integral models and their relation with this. And uh, so uh, let me say again that we want to study this particular deformation of a theory. And I want to convince you that uh, this particular equation makes sense and it would define non-perturbatively uh, an RG flow that uh, exists for any CFT and it lands at the CFT in the infrared. And so for the moment, uh, I just ask you to suspend your disbelief and uh, bear with me and let's see if we can find something interesting from this. And uh, so I, in this lecture, I want to show you what what people mean by the statement that this is a solvable deformation. Uh, and what is the meaning of this equation? So if you think in terms of the path integral formalism, this equation tells you that, for example, if you want to compute the partition function of the theory on some space, and for example, uh, I will consider the torus, Then this equation gives you a differential equation for the partition function. That is given by, by this thing, where this is an expectation value on M computed uh, at finite value of the deformation parameter alpha. So essentially, the statement that this uh, is going to be something solvable means that uh, we are able to compute this right-hand side. And essentially, we will see that uh, it has a, a sort of geometric interpretation in terms of a deformation of the geometry of M. And uh, well, what the first thing that we can see is that uh, we proved uh, this statement that uh, we can essentially point split, uh, if we are careful, this, uh, this combination of two-point functions. So what we can observe is essentially that this uh, is not going to be singular. This is the first thing. And uh, also I want to point out that essentially this type of observables is what uh, people have been uh, proposing how to compute, especially John Cardi. And uh, uh, for example, also partition functions into some domains in the plane where we need to be careful about boundary conditions and we must impose boundary conditions such that there, are, there is no leak of energy or momentum at the boundary. OK, so the, uh, the first thing we want to do is uh, to uh, come back to the study of uh, the partition function on the, uh, sorry, the energy levels of, on the cylinder. And uh, on, the, on the cylinder, we found a universal formula for the diagonal expectation values of this operator TT bar. OK, so now we want to deform the theory and draw some consequences. So we will get some uh, energy levels that depend on R and alpha. But uh, so essentially, the conclusion that you can draw in the path integral formalism from this equation is that uh, when you deform the theory in such a way or with any operator, essentially you're, you're Hamiltonian is going to change by some amount that is just the 
the integral of the deformation of the action on a spatial slice. So let me write it like this. Yes, thank you. So this is dx1. OK, so from, from this formula, if you imagine doing uh, perturbation theory in quantum mechanics, uh, you get that the correction to the energy is given. It's given by this, right? And uh, so we get, because uh, on the cylinder, the one point function doesn't depend on the insertion point. We just get a factor r when we do the integral. Okay, so we get uh, this uh, differential equation for the deformation of the energy levels. And so essentially, yeah. yes, thank you. Yes. And uh, okay, so here I didn't write the dependence of the momentum of, on alpha but because the momentum is quantized, so it would still be quantized in uh, the same unit. Uh, well, and historically, essentially this is a bit how, how this was discovered, because uh, there was uh, the study of uh, particular integrable deformation of the S matrix in integrable models. And in integral models, uh, essentially, you can compute the finite volume spectrum if you know the S matrix. And uh, so plugging this deformation inside the machinery of integral models, the uh, thermodynamic beta onset, you can derive uh, this equation. And then, uh, so the right-hand side was recognized as the expectation value of TT bar. But uh, in this form, this looks very universal and it, it's uh, essentially, it's believed the, so in this formalism, it's obvious that it applies also to non-integrable models. Okay, so <laughs> let me make some comments on this differential equation. It's a very nonlinear equation and uh, it's called the inviscid Burgers equation, and it appears in hydrodynamics. But so, well, the simplest case is uh, when Pn equals to zero. Then you get uh, there is an implicit solution. Where essentially you just need to evaluate your uh, original energy levels, but at a different uh, value of R that depends on alpha. And uh, so this R tilde is defined uh, non-linearly in this way. So it's a very non-linear because it contains already the solution. And uh, well, this equation, uh, in general, it is known that for any initial condition, it will uh, produce some singularities, some square root singularities. Uh, at, if you take alpha big enough, even if it's regular at alpha equals zero. Uh, <laughs> and now, okay, I want to show you explicitly what, what is the solution in the case where the initial theory is a CFT, even though in principle you can study this equation for any initial theory. And uh, notice that, uh, so this solvability is different from integrability. So it, it tells you how to solve it only, uh, I mean, you need to be able to solve it for the initial theory. But the, the effects of the deformations are uh, solved. And uh, so, okay, so for a 
50. Well, uh, I will just reintroduce uh, the radius because uh, I will need to analyze the dependence on R later. But in CFT, so the dependence will be trivial. So we will just have some numbers here. These numbers are depend uh, in a given Verma module. This will depend on delta. So it will be delta plus delta bar minus this Casimir shift that depends on a central charge. And then they will be spaced by integers at, for a, all the states that are descendants of the, of the primary. And similarly, uh, well, similarly, the momentum would just be integers, and I will mostly restrict uh, later to a sector where the momentum is zero. Well, if you just plug in this differential equation for these uh, initial conditions at alpha equals zero, you find some solution that uh, I will copy. And okay, I'm writing R times C because it's the natural uh, dimensional quantity. And uh, so let me re redefine the dimensionless coupling alpha tilde, which is just going to be essentially alpha divided by r squared. it a bit better. So this is a square root. OK. So the, this is, a, well, this, this is what it is. But I want to make some plots. And uh, so essentially, let me just say, it would look different for dif the si depending on the sign of alpha. And because actually, you can say that there are two different theories for alpha greater than 0, alpha less than 0. And there are, in fact, uh, so you have to think that there are two different uh, RG flows that uh, arrive at the CFT. And, uh, about these signs, if you look at different papers, they will change from paper to paper. So what I call alpha greater than zero would be alpha less than zero in some other paper. And, uh, well, let me draw in in some given uh, in some given Verma module. Just uh, I'll start drawing the levels of the, of the CFT on, on this axis. And this will be R. And well, so you just start from, um, let's say we take a unitary CFT, so C is greater than 0. And this is the module of the identity. So this will be minus C over 12. And uh, let's assume that the other levels are positive. There is only one negative. And they will be shifted just by integers. They also have yes. Thank you. Okay, so and now uh, well if you plot this function, so here uh, I'm considering J would be zero, but uh, so you will find that uh, so for large R they behave like the levels in the CFT and then they they bend like this, so they they never cross. And notice, so I'm assuming that essentially all the degeneracies are maintained. So all these levels in the CFT are become extremely degenerate uh, at high energy, 
because you have to count all the number of descendants. And I'm assuming that the deformation depends uh, only on the energy according to that equation. So we will keep all the degeneracies. And uh, well, you can see from here that uh, the fact that they don't scale like one over r at small radius tells you that uh, in the UV you've spoiled completely the conformal behavior. And this theory will not be controlled by a UV fixed point. Because if you put a theory on, the, on a finite cylinder and you shrink the cylinder, you, in, you are inspecting the UV of this theory. So for a normal quantum field theory, you will see that it will scale like a CFT. And so in this case, if you have a negative level, so this level will also at some finite value of, of r that depends on alpha. And uh, so essentially, for, for, the, for the ground state of a unitary theory, it will be this value. The ground state will uh, develop some, uh, some square root singularity. And So this is literally just this formula of where this is zero. Or and yeah. in the case where alpha is greater than zero, so that alpha tilde, which is alpha over r squared, as, uh, is positive for positive uh, mn. I mean, is it positive? Exactly. So for positive mn, we will not hit the singularity. But if there is one level with negative mn, yeah. Well, in, in this case, you can also see, uh, so yesterday we saw classically the emergence of the Namugoto action. And this is, if you take a, uh, an appropriate central charge, this is the spectrum of the Namugoto string. Uh, actually, if you get the spectrum that you get in like con quantization in D target space dimensions, if you, if you take the central charge D minus 2. And uh, well, this. Uh, tells you, you can give a thermal uh, interpretation of this singularity. Because, uh, so if you imagine putting a theory uh, on a torus, let me take again the standard color. So RC would be a value, you will find that for any alpha, there is a value of R such that uh, for the theory as a real spectrum for a cylinder that's bigger than RC, but if you try to make it smaller, this level will become complex. Yeah, and this will be, it depends on how the theory behaves in this region. So if you take any quantum field theory, you will find some, something like this happening. Uh, well, uh, if you put the theory on a torus, uh, the periodic uh, uh, dimension can be interpreted as uh, an inverse temperature. So uh, the fact that you cannot put it on a torus that's smaller than R tells you that there is like a maximum temperature that you can reach that is uh, uh, it's called the Hagedorn temperature. It's, it, it's, it's because if you count the, the number of states for, for a given energy, for very large energy, uh, this will grow exponentially. For where this uh, temperature is, it's exactly the inverse of RC. And uh, you can see, uh, so in, in CFT, well, th this will grow like the square root of the energy with, with some constant that depends on a central charge. And some constant here. It's Cardi formula, uh, but if you see, because we keep the same degeneracies, we can map it to what happens in this theory, and we see that there is this behavior. <laughs> well, the, you, I'm sure you can guess uh, the other case. Now we consider the case where uh, alpha is, is uh, negative. Well, in this case, you, you would find that uh, they're essentially, so this would be 
alpha less than zero and they are deformed in the other direction. So the positive levels now will all develop a singularity. So and these positions move to the right. So you will find that now it's even more strange because you find that for a given value of r, only a finite number of levels are real and uh, all the other ones will be complex. And uh, so also in this case, there is a coincidence and there is a spectrum that uh, is exactly the same of this one for neg negative alpha. And uh, it has to do also with the conjecture of, uh, for an interpretation of this in ADS3 CFT2 for this sign. And so this spectrum essentially, uh, you, you will get this formula if you study some black holes uh, that live uh, in asymptotically ADS3 uh, spaces in standard uh, general relativity with negative cosmological constant. And in general relativity, you have a well-defined concept of measuring the energy and momentum inside a finite volume of space-time. And uh, so if you measure the, the energy and momentum of these uh, black, uh, BTZ black hole solutions inside some region of radius r, you will get uh, this formula where you can, you have to think that m and j now are continuous parameter that are the mass and the angular momentum of the black hole. And uh, so this has to do with this uh, conjecture that, uh, that this might be related to a way to, inter to generalize the ADS-CFT but in finite volume, which is, uh, so it's a conjecture and also uh, debated at the moment. And, um, well, so, uh, now I would like to uh, say something about another, uh, another computation, which will be the partition function uh, on the torus. Uh, so, oh, I have another one. Okay, but before doing that, I want to make some comments about uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, are the properties of this deformed theory under scale transformations. So supposing that we start from a CFT. So we know uh, th this would be the only thing of what I said so far, uh, that essentially it's valid only if you start from a CFT and uh, do this deformation, uh, and not if you start from a generic quantum field theory. So, so the, the CFT is uh, scale invariant, but now we are uh, deforming it uh, in some non-perturbative way with a dimensionful parameter. And because this is non-perturbative, you can expect that this, uh, the, the scaling of this parameter is uh, it's something exact. And we, so we saw it in these energy levels that uh, the combination that appears is alpha over r squared. So it's, if you put your theory on some space and you rescale the metric with some factor, this should be equivalent to uh, the form in, uh, so to just rescaling alpha in this way. And, uh, but, uh, so this suggests that there is a relation between the operator that generates uh, shifts in alpha and the operator that generates uh, scaling transformations. So uh, essentially, if you do this transformation, this is given by a, a total integral over your space of the trace of the, the expectation value of the trace of the stress energy tensor. And so this is a, tells you how your partition function scale, uh, behaves under scalings. But uh, okay, this essentially has to be also how the partition function behaves under shifts in alpha. So this, uh, 
is the integral of uh, the expectation value of tt bar times alpha. And uh, did I make some mistake? Wh which one, sorry? Let's try. So by this, I mean, for example, in the case that we saw bef that we did before, that R becomes bigger. R times lambda. And then you saw that everything depends on lambda, on alpha over R. Yeah, so the everything is a function of uh, alpha over R. So uh, R over R squared. So if you do this rescaling, it's the same as rescaling alpha. Sorry, you just explaining why um, you wouldn't expect alpha to get some numbers. So I think the answer is because we are doing something non-perturbative, in, intrinsically. And uh, there is only this scale. And if, if you get some results, it, they have to scale like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, yeah, we will see in the case where you can compute things that uh, this is what what happens. Uh, but then, so th this suggests a strange relation, but or maybe not strange. But it actu actually, so in the deformed theory, theta is equal. At finite alpha, it's just equal to alpha times the uh, tt bar operator, at least under uh, integral and of the expectation value. So the question is if, if this is true also more locally. And uh, so in, classically, you can check if you study, for example, this uh, uh, in a Nambugoto action, this is uh, exactly true classically. Uh, and uh, so this is a. Uh, this equation is, is also part of the, the support for this proposal for the cutoff of uh, ADS3 because, uh, well, there are some corrections if you want to study that you're in curved, uh, consider curved matrix. But uh, essentially, it looks like also some equations that you get in general relativity when you consider this operation of uh, studying it in finite volume. Well, I'll try to describe uh, maybe briefly the logic of this computation of the partition function uh, on the torus, which was done uh, by Cardi. And uh, uh, so essentially, we start from the equation that we had at the beginning. So we, we have to compute this expectation value. But uh, then the idea is, uh, is essentially that, uh, well, we need to use the interpretation of the stress energy tensor as generating some, uh, t some uh, the deformations of the metric. So we have to consider the torus with, with some metric. Uh, and let, I'll denote this. So now the size of the torus is important. And uh, well, essentially, you, you rewrite these as uh, some uh, variations with respect to variations of the metric that are uh, the same everywhere on the torus. It's just uh, essentially a uniform change of coordinates. And uh, what you find uh, at the end is that uh, you can rewrite it in terms of the formations of the sizes of the torus, therefore. So it, the result that you would get at the end that I don't have time to discuss is uh, essentially that if you rewrite uh, everything in terms of the, 
some object where I define this as the partition function of the torus divided by the area of the torus, which is uh, so I'm consider these two vectors. Well, th then you get uh, this equation. which is, uh, it's given here. So I'm, I'm just showing it to show the, the general logic that, uh, so in this, uh, for these kinds of, kinds of computations, you get some generic results that look, look nice and they, they look like they might have some geometric interpretations. And I also want to mention that there is a conjecture that this uh, deformation corresponds uh, exactly uh, to coupling your original theory to a particular type of uh, topological quantum gravity in two dimensions, which is called uh, Jakib Teitelboim uh, gravity. And uh, therefore, maybe the degrees of freedom we should look, consider they're not really local operators, but maybe this is a theory that in some way describes uh, fluctuations of uh, changes of coordinates. Uh, and uh, yeah, but these are still. Uh, I would say open questions, and uh, uh, it, it's very much open what, what is the real physical interpretation of this, and if this can become a tool maybe to compute something physically interesting. And uh, so with this, I would conclude the part on the TT bar deformation, and uh, I would then talk about integral models. Yeah, from the thermal point of view, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, so how to interpret the Hagedorn transition from uh, the, in terms of the thermal partition function? Is, is that the question? Well, you had, you were thinking of it as the system size being the temperature, but you found it the other way around. Uh -huh. Well, well, from the other point of view, it's because the, the energy of the ground state becomes complex. And, uh, but w quite why this happens, uh, no, no, I don't, I don't know. I also have a question. So now you have been talking about putting the theory on the torus, but at some point it seems to be important that you could take these two operators and take them quite far apart so that you could factorize the expectation value and write this is an important differential mm -hmm. equation. Mm -hmm. So is it just a technical thing and on the torus you can still do it or should I be worried? On the torus I will not need to factorize the expectation value. But what you will use is that uh, uh, there is translation invariance, so you, you can point split these two operators as, as much as you want. So you can even do two integrals independently, or you can fix one at a point and just integrate over the other. And then this becomes, uh, when you integrate only over one of them, so keep, say that the second one is fixed, this is uh, how a one-point function is deformed if you change the metric, for example. And, and uh, you, you interpret it like this. And, but, but maybe there is also a more powerful reformulation where you sort of show that this uh, can be integrated to the boundary, well, in the case where, where you have boundaries. Uh, and then the variation would just be an integral over the boundary of how some deformation of the geometry of the boundary. Is this, uh, well, can you give a reference to this? Uh, the paper, yeah, this is in the paper of uh, Cardi which is called the uh, random geometry and TT bars. <laughs> 